In my now uh, many years of, um, of uh, teaching economics, I've, I've learned that um, no matter what time it is, you should always start when the lull you know, occurs in the crowd. So we're going to go ahead and start. You sort of settle down, and uh, this is a good time to uh, jump in. Um, so in this uh, session, we're going to talk about the economics of fractional reserve banking. And I want to emphasize that uh, we're going to uh, concentrate our effort <clears throat> on the economics. Uh, the economic theory of fractional reserve banking. We will not uh, uh, delve into the legal questions uh, or the uh, moral questions of fractional reserve banking, all very interesting uh, areas of uh, uh, discussion. Um, and if you're interested in reading uh, something on those uh, points, I highly recommend uh, Guido Holtzman's book, The Ethics of Money Production. That's a very excellent uh, treatment of uh, all these issues, the economic and the, and the uh, ethical issues <coughs> involved. <clears throat> so let's start. Uh, what we'll, uh, the outline here is uh, we'll start with a, um, a review of the market system of money and banking, and then uh, and to see how this uh, uh, integrates into the, the working of the economy. And then we'll uh, introduce fractional reserve banking. We'll give a definition and talk about uh, you know, what it, uh, how it operates. And then what its uh, implications are for the working uh, of the market economy. And then uh, the third thing we'll do at the end, we'll talk about the, uh, the justifications that have been given, uh, or the main justification at least that's been given for uh, treating fractional reserve banking as a part uh, of the market economy. So we'll deal with this question of whether or not uh, economic theory would lead us to the conclusion that fractional, bank, uh, fractional reserve banking is or is not a kind of natural part of the working of, uh, of a market economy. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, just review real quickly what, uh, what Dr. Engelhardt uh, talked about yesterday on the, on the market development of money. <clears throat> We know that out of a barter economy, we, we think about, uh, <laughs> just to remind you, in economic theorizing, of course, we always think about these things I in, the, in the structure of logic, right? We're not, we're not interested in the details of um, uh, time and place and so on. We're just, we're just interested in, in the flow of the logic of how uh, 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 things arise in the market and, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So we start with a barter economy because that would be the precursor to money. And uh, we notice uh, logically the double coincidence of wants problem as uh, 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 Dr. Engelhart was explaining uh, yesterday. And then the solution to this uh, is just an entrepreneurial innovation. Somebody in the market just hits upon the notion that um, he can take his goods and trade with a third party who has a general, more generally saleable good that he can then take and trade for what he wants with his intended trading partner. <clears throat> and of course, if one person can see this, it's not a uh, uh, you know, rocket science. If one person can perceive that a more generally saleable good solves the double coincidence of wants problem, then of course, other people can see this too, right? So it's just a question of um, a development of this insight that one person in history would have made initially uh, that uh, le leads to the development of a general medium of exchange, again, as Dr. Engel Engelhardt has already uh, 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 outlined for us. <clears throat> now, I might add one, uh, one other element to this, though, and uh, this is the uh, certification of money. So as uh, Dr. Eng Engelhardt explained, it may have been in history that um, some of the things that were used initially as uh, a medium of exchange uh, were not suitable to be a general medium of exchange. Things like cattle or copper pots or uh, you know, uh, bushels of wheat or you know, things of this sort. So another entrepreneurial innovation would have been that someone noticing people using these different various things as a, a media of exchange <clears throat> would have uh, hit upon the notion that there might be just one commodity or just a handful of commodities that are actually superior in their physical properties as a medium of exchange. They're durable and divisible and you know, the standard kind of uh, uh, desirable uh, elements of, uh, of a commodity uh, money that you would read in any uh, money and banking text. So this too is just a natural entrepreneurial innovation. It's just, it's just the, the natural entrepreneurial inclination to provide a superior product, right? And, and then to uh, you know, profit 
uh, earn the profit from providing a superior product to people. <clears throat> so once this is done, it, it probably would occur synchronously with certification. That is, you would, uh, an entrepreneur would think, you know, gold is probably the best commodity for medium exchange for the reasons that, uh, again, Dr. Engelhardt has already explained. But it'd be even better if I certified it, if I stamped on the gold, if I formed it into a standard uh, uh, shape and size, and I stamp on it that as the producer of this money, I guarantee the weight and fineness of the gold in this coin. So coinage too would have just been a natural entrepreneurial uh, strategy, right? It's a business strategy. You can make money, right? You can survive and make a business minting, uh, minting coins, either buying the gold from a mining company and then minting it and earning the fee from minting. And of course, the uh, customers are willing to pay the fee uh, because having the certification is valuable and you don't have to weigh and assay the raw commodity every time it's used, right? So this is a viable business strategy, or to put it to put it in the more general terms, this is how the production of money would be integrated into the uh, regular system of economic calculation that all goods, the production of all goods, is subject to on the market. It's no different. It's just private enterprise, the entrepreneurs in the market, uh, producing a product uh, and earning a profit. They earn the profit by charging fees for the uh, 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 differential advantage that uh, consumers get from having certification of the money. Right? So, that, so that's how money would develop uh, to its uh, sort of, um, uh, at least historically known end state of perfection, if you will, or development. Now, what about banking? Well, banking uh, would develop along two lines. Uh, there could be other things too, but they're not uh, necessary for us to go into in this talk. But along two lines that uh, we need to talk about fractional reserve banking. Uh, the first is what uh, is sometimes called deposit banking. So we see, again, the logic of how you could establish a business as an entrepreneur by innovating and providing a superior product to the customer for which the customer will pay a fee that generates revenue so you can cover your costs, right? just like any business. And this is uh, to deposit banking is where the uh, entrepreneur who runs a bank <clears throat> would take the certification that's on the coin and place the certification on a piece of paper or in an electronic ledger. So something like a bank note. Now, what's the advantage of a banknote to the customer? Why would a customer pay for a banknote instead of you know, just using the coins? And uh, hopefully you can see right away it's the convenience and safety. You can carry around uh, large amounts of uh, 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 purchasing power uh, with, with paper, um, you know, instead of gold or silver. Uh, it's uh, you know, safer to carry. It uh, doesn't uh, clink in your pocket as... Dr. Engelhardt was uh, explaining and alert the uh, thieves among us uh, to, your, to your stash, uh, and so on. So there are various sorts, and electronic versions of this, of course, are even more uh, uh, beneficial because we can transfer the, the claim uh, electronically, right? Then we don't even have to carry any. We just, you know, we just, uh, we're just on Amazon, and, and, you know, just, uh, you know, put it on my account, you know, take it out of my checking account. Here's my debit card number and we swipe our debit cards. So it's that, it's that kind of thing. Of course, people will pay fees for this because it's, it's valuable to them or to the extent that it's valuable to them, they'll pay fees. And so you can have a, uh, an entrepreneurially uh, run bank that's deposit banking. And, and so this would be the first step. Now the key though to the, the bank note or this, this certification on a piece of paper uh, becoming uh, a medium of exchange, the key to this, of course, is the uh, absolute and un unequivocal redemption of the banknote for money proper on demand at par. Uh, so this is a condition that uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, emphasized in uh, Theory of Money and Credit, his great treatise on uh, money. <clears throat> uh, so if, if, if customers are to take their banknotes instead of gold coins, and spend them uh, uh, with merchants who aren't customers of the same bank, then the merchant has to have very high confidence that 
he can take the uh, banknote down to the customer's bank and redeem it for an equivalent amount of gold, right? It, the money proper. It has to be a, a firm and uh, secure uh, redemption claim. If that happens, then then uh, the uh, the banknote, the so-called money substitute, uh, can be also then a medium of exchange. It can actually be a substitute for money or a companion medium of exchange, if you wish to put it this way. <clears throat> now, the natural progression of this development, of course, as uh, we're sort of unfolding it, would be for what uh, Mises like to call money certificates. And a money certificate, Mises de uh, defines as a money substitute, a claim to money, this redemption claim to money, uh, for which there is a 100% reserve of money um, uh, that the customers can have for redemption. So the deposit bank would first initially start as a 100% reserve bank, not a fractional reserve bank. I mean, it seems the first step would be a 100% reserve bank. This would give uh, you know uh, greater confidence to the uh, merchants at large that they could in fact redeem these claims on demand at par. There would be no question of this, uh, or at least uh, very little uh, 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 uncertainty about this, uh, if there were a 100% reserve. So we see this then uh, as the initial development of, of a market uh, institution of banking. Now, <clears throat> Let's, uh, so here we summarize this, right? The money emerges from the market activity as this commodity, and then entrepreneurs certify the commodity, and uh, the customers get this benefit of standardization uh, of the bank note or the uh, checking account and so on. <clears throat> and the key point that the production of this uh, money and then the money substitutes, as we're speaking about, would be integrated into the market. All the production is based upon the same system of economic calculation, is it profitable? Are there losses? You know, the entrepreneur would adjust production according to the regular pattern of profit and loss. <clears throat> now, there could be different ways in which the money certificates could be uh, issued by the bank, and we want to make just a, we want to follow along one line of how this could be done. Uh, not, and uh, the argument that we're making throughout the uh, uh, talk uh, doesn't depend on whether it's done one way or another, but, but I want to do this for uh, uh, purposes of illustration. <clears throat> so once the money substitute is issued by, or the money certificate is issued by the, uh, by the bank, the bank could treat in the sense of its own assets and liabilities, the bank could make a contract with the customer with respect to this bank note in one of two ways. One way would be, as we've, uh, the case that we're taking, is deposit banking. Deposit banking is when the customer would come into the bank and deposit the coins in the bank for safekeeping and deposit them. And then when they're deposited, the bank, uh, the customer transfers ownership of the coins to the bank in exchange for the banknote. That would be one feasible way in which this could be arranged. Uh, and, and I want to do it this way, just again for purposes of illustration. Uh, Murray Rothbard, in his work, does it the other way. The other way is, to, is that this uh, relationship between the customer and the bank can be treated as a warehouse relationship, a bailment contract, where the customer comes in and doesn't uh, trade the ownership of the money for the ownership of the money certificate, but pays a storage fee to the bank. And the bank is just a warehouse then storing the customer's gold. And the uh, bank note it, it legally then is just a, uh, a, a ticket of uh, ownership. It's just a sign of ownership. So, so we're not going to follow out in, in that legal path. We're going to follow this other legal path. And the reason to, to follow the other legal path is because we can, we can uh, make a nice uh, contrast between how it affects the bank's assets and liabilities compared to fractional reserve banking. So that's the only reason to do this. So this is what it would look like, a, a typical uh, arrangement between the uh, customer and the bank. This is what the bank's uh, balance sheet would look like, the T account in their balance sheet would look like. If a customer came into the bank and deposited $1,000 in gold and then gave up ownership of that to the bank, you, you now own the gold, and I now own this uh, claim. 
So the claim is in a checking account. So the claim is electronically um, uh, recorded in a checking account. That's what the customer owns. In other words, the, the bank now has a liability. They must pay the, uh, the owner of the checking account funds on demand at par the money that they're holding in reserve. That, that's the contract that they enter into. Right? Whoever has the checking account funds, present them at the bank, and the bank will redeem on demand at par the, uh, the money reserve. Uh, by the way, uh, hopefully you can see right away if the if this is a warehouse contract that the customer forms with the bank, then the, uh, it won't affect the bank's balance sheet at all, right? Because the bank doesn't own anything. The bank doesn't own the gold. It doesn't have any liability claim with respect to the uh, you know IOUs that it has to other people. So so it's a different uh, impact. So we do it this way so that we can we can make a direct comparison to fractional reserve banking, where again it affects the uh, bank's balance sheet, as we'll see. <clears throat> now the other main point, though, that we want to make here is that um, this uh, this production of the money certificate then leaves the total stock of money the same. Nothing has changed, right? The, the bank has simply replaced one form of the medium of exchange with another. They, they've taken money off the market and used it now as a reserve instead of a medium of exchange. They're not using it as a medium of exchange. They're using it as a reserve. And now they've issued another medium of exchange, the bank note, or the in this case, a checking account, that serves in place of or as a substitute for money. So when the banks issue checking accounts, they do not change the total stock of money in society. They just change the form of the medium of exchange from money proper to money, uh, the, the money substitutes. By the way, uh, just as an aside, in, uh, before the uh, uh, financial meltdown that began in 2007, if you looked at the M1 money supply in the U.S., um, it was roughly 25% money proper, Federal Reserve notes, and 75% checking account balances. When we got into the middle of the uh, financial uh, crisis in 2009, the balance between the two is 50-50. So, so, so this is still a live issue in our uh, economy, right? Where people, people choose between the two. They, they can move their, their funds between the two forms of the medium of exchange. Sometimes they prefer money proper. Sometimes they're more inclined to prefer the, the money substitute. And it's qu quite obvious why they, <laughs> or hopefully it's obvious to you at least, that the, why they preferred the money proper uh, during a financial meltdown. You don't want to rely upon the redemption claim of the fractional reserve banks. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, that, that's the first uh, point to make uh, with respect to the economic uh, consequences of the uh, uh, of, uh, deposit banking. <clears throat> uh, now, here, here's just a uh, quote uh, from a famous economist about 100% reserve banking. And the quote goes, uh, the bank money, the, the money substitute, or the bank-issued money substitute, what this author calls the bank money, just offsets the amount of ordinary money, gold or currency, placed in the bank's vault. No money creation has taken place. A 100% reserve banking system has a neutral effect on money and the macro economy because it has no effect on the money supply. Now that quote was from the uh, great economist, Paul Samuelson. So even, even the, you know, the Arch Keynesians recognize this, this, uh, this point, right? We don't. This is not a nutty right-wing, you know, conspiracy argument. This is a you know well-accepted conventional uh, view. <clears throat> okay, so now let's think about the next step. What about money uh, production? <clears throat> and this uh, here, I've, I've just uh, borrowed uh, Rothbard's um, diagrammatic analysis, where he he borrows it from Wicksteed, where we have the total stock of money as a vertical line, right? The total stock of money at any given time, or the total stock of any good at a given point in time is fixed. So it doesn't depend upon what its price is, right? It's just physically fixed. So that's the amount of money. Let's say we start at M0. That would be the amount of money, a trillion dollars or whatever it is. And then the purchasing power of money would be determined by the extent of total demand for money given that total stock. And the total demand for money is the total demand that people have to hold money or whatever this good is as a good in their stock of goods, as an asset. So we're all holding money balances right now, cash on our person or checking account balances or so on. We're, we're not instantly and uh, completely taking those money balances and buying goods 
or investing to earn the rate of interest. We're holding money. And again, we're not going to go into the reasons of uh, you know, why this is done, but we'll just rely upon that background for, uh, for our analysis. Now, in, uh, in the uh, market system that we've described so far, where money is something like gold coins and their money certificates issued by banks, then this purchasing power of money here at point A, where we begin uh, this uh, dynamic analysis, corresponds to a cost of producing the gold coins that generates a, uh, uh, a stable rate of return, a rate of return on investment that doesn't inspire profit, you know, more production and profit, or uh, 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 include uh, losses and then a decrease in production. We're at an equilibrium, so to speak, with respect to the production of money. And then we ask the question, well, uh, what, what, uh, what could possibly occur? What would be the cause of an increased production of money, for example? Would, would the uh, miners and the uh, minting companies just sort of arbitrarily increase the money supply? Just, hey, we're producing money. Let's just produce another 20%. Well, no, if they did this, they would drive the purchasing power of money down below its cost and suffer losses. Just like if uh, Tim Cook at uh, Apple Inc. decided, so how many iPhones are we producing a month? Uh, oh, it's uh, to 12 million? Let's produce 25 million a month. No, he's not going to do that, right? Because if he did that, in order to sell that volume, he would have to lower his price. And presumably, that price would be below his cost, and he'd suffer losses. So again, this is just a general uh, analysis of how production of any good is regulated by profit and loss. The only way it would be uh, forthcoming for entrepreneurs who are producing money to produce more of it is just like any other good, if the demand for it first goes up, or they anticipate that the demand for it's going to go up. If the demand for money goes up, then if they don't produce more money, the, the uh, market value of money is going to be way up here, way above cost, right? So then they'll want to ramp up production. They'll buy more inputs. They'll open up more mines. They'll you know, make more capital investment in new technology to get the gold out of seawater or whatever. And all of this has higher costs. And so their cost structure would, would increase. And their total stock would increase to the point where, again, there's a balance of uh, uh, the uh, return that's earned on investment in, in money production uh, 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 that would be similar to the rate of return that's earned in other like production processes, the mining of copper, or the you know, uh, timber cutting, or whatever other things are in a similar class of investable projects. Right? So that's how the market production of money would function. To say this uh, in a slightly different way, under a, under a system of a market-produced gold standard, the, the supply of money is not fixed. The supply of money expands or contracts according to the demand for money, just like any other good. The, the production of it expands or contracts according to demand. It's, it's no different. Right? Okay, so that's, that's the, the gist of, um, of the market system for money. Now let's turn, our, uh, turn to a credit. This is the, the second function that banks uh, perform that we need to investigate here, that they would perform on the, on the market economy. And this is the intermediate credit. The banks borrow from savers, they pool the funds, and then they lend to investors. And uh, for this function as a middleman, they're just performing, again, the generalized function of an entrepreneur who's a middleman, like Walmart, who buys wholesale products. And then they package them in a retail environment and sell them for retail prices. Right. Same thing here. The banks are paying wholesale interest rates to the savers to borrow the money. And then uh, they're, they're making a more efficient use of the money so that they can earn retail interest rates when they lend to investors. So this is how the, the system of credit intermediation would work. And again, this is even the language of financial intermediation indicates this middleman function. Right? It's just a, that's where the interest spread comes from in a market economy. It doesn't come from leveraging. It comes, it, that is borrowing short and lending long, right? Uh, exploiting the yield curve. It comes from the greater efficiency of performing the lending activity to investors, investigating who are creditworthy borrowers and you know, bearing the uncertainty of making these investments and relieving the savers of these difficulties so that they're willing to accept the wholesale interest rate 
in lieu of having to do all this themselves. They're just relying upon the division of labor. It's just an extension, if you will, of the division of labor. <clears throat> so credit intermediation, too, would be regulated by profit and loss. If the uh, banks wanted to, I mean, they wouldn't just say, hey, uh, it's nice and sunny today. I'm in a good mood. Let's lend 20% more. <laughs> right? Because if they did this, again, they would have to move down the demand curve, right? And they'd have to accept lower interest rates from the borrowers. And they'd have to pay the savers higher interest rates to increase the supply of saving. And their, and their interest spread would be squeezed. It would be squeezed to the point where they don't get enough revenue from that interest spread to cover their costs. And that's what we mean when we say that credit intermediation is regulated by profit and loss. It's no different than in, in that respect uh, than the production of anything in the market. It's, it's integrated fully into the market. <clears throat> OK, so now let's turn to, uh, oh, let me uh, provide this one, again, kind of stylistic example of this, just to drive the point home. And then we'll turn to the fractional reserve banking. <clears throat> Now, this, like my other uh, example, the balance sheet of the bank, this one is uh, a, an extreme example, right? It's a particular example. It's not meant to be uh, 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 always the case. It's just an illustration of what might happen. So in the extreme case, the, the bank's balance sheet might look something like this, right? Where they borrow from uh, savers. They pay them certificates of deposit for one year. Savers come in, and they the bank negotiates, and they uh, take in $5,000, and then... They make uh, uh, one-year loans equal in the time structure of that $5,000. And then they do the same thing with longer-term loans that savers are willing to uh, grant them, $10,000 in five-year CDs. Now they owe savers $10,000 in five years. Then they make a loan, uh, a structure of loans that are five years long so that they can be paid back in a timely way to pay their, their liabilities, right? Now, of course, they don't have to do exactly this, but they do have to pay attention to the time structure of their assets and liabilities. For example, a more, a more uh, a reasonable case would be that bank, a bank finds out that over time that a lot of the one-year CDs roll over. Maybe like 60% of their uh, one-year CDs are renewed or new customers come in and they have this kind of fund that's fairly stable over time. Well, then they could take the entrepreneurial uh, venture of lending that, that pool out for longer periods of time, right? This, this would just be another entrepreneurial um, innovation that would uh, be subject to uncertainty and maybe losses, but maybe profit, right? So, so it's just a normal uh, business activity for them to try something like this. The point is they have to be sensitive. They're always put under pressure, the banks are, uh, by the market by us in the market, uh, to keep the time structure of their assets and liabilities in balance. They can't get out of balance. They have to satisfy our time preferences, to put it uh, in, the, in the theoretical sense. So credit intermediation leaves the bank liquid. It leaves it solvent, right? They're, they're the ones who are making, you know, uh, experts in uh, deciding who to lend the money to. And so they're better than the customers are at doing this, the savers. So their loans are good, or at least better, again, than they would be otherwise. And so their balance sheet is intact. There's nothing uh, unusual about this. There's nothing different about the character of their balance sheet relative to an auto company or a, or a tech company or anything else. All, all businesses in the uh, market economy have to pay attention to, to liquidity and solvency uh, of their activity. So credit interme intermediation does not change the supply of credit or the time structure of it uh, fundamentally, right? So it looks something like this. Uh, again, if we were to diagram this, uh, the only way in the market economy, if we start with conditions of demand and supply for credit uh, at point A, the only way for the interest rate to be pushed down or the supply of credit to be increased is for uh, people's time preferences to fall. Now, again, we're simplifying from other factors that can affect credit. We'll take this up uh, tomorrow in the, in the uh, time preference lecture. But, but here, you know, the basic point is that time preference would uh, drive interest rates down in the market as a reflection of the fact that uh, savers' time preference rates have gone down. And so we would get something like this, I1 and C1. <clears throat> okay, so now that we've uh, canvassed over the... Uh, 
how the market would work, let's turn to the uh, issue of fiduciary media and fractional reserve banking. So these are just uh, the terms or definitions. Uh, fiduciary media are money substitutes for which a bank holds only a fraction of money reserve. Um, Dr. Engelhardt uh, referred to the goldsmiths uh, introducing in England, uh, introducing this, uh, this innovation of, uh, of uh, uh, running their reserve, of simply uh, seeing that there, there was a big pool of funds sitting in their bank vault. They didn't pay much attention to the legal status of, you know, whether it was legally permissible or morally okay for them to lend out these funds. They just started lending them out. And so they run the reserve fraction down. So that, that's where we get the language of fractional reserve banking, right? So, so fiduciary issue is when the banks issue checking account balances for which they only hold a fraction of reserve as money. So, so that's our language. Our, uh... Now, how do they do this? How does the, how does the bank uh, uh, issue uh, fiduciary media? And the answer is they just extend credit. They, they, ju they, just, they, they keystroke on a computer, right? They just hit a keystroke. Just like, it, it's very similar to, and we'll make a few analogies here, it's very similar to the, to the uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, they, they just hit a button on a printing press, right? And then more money comes out at the end of the process. The, the bank just hits a, hits a key on, on their keypad and a checking account balance increases of a customer. So a customer goes into the bank and says, oh, I wanna borrow money for a new car. And the bank says, yeah, you've been a good customer for us. Sure, we'll lend you the money. They don't borrow the money from a saver. They just write the loan into the customer's checking account. That's, that's how fiduciary media comes into existence. We call this credit creation. The issue of the fiduciary media we call monetary inflation. And the issue of the credit out of thin air, if you will, uh, we call credit creation. Notice neither one of these phenomena can occur on the market economy that we've described so far, right? We're leaving open the question as to whether this is integratable into the market economy. But so far, <laughs> this could not happen with uh, commodity money and 100% reserve banking. <clears throat> okay, so what's the effect of this? How, how does this look on the balance sheet? So let's say the bank, again, has a cash reserve of 1,000 that the customer has deposited, and then they uh, opened up a checking account and put the 1,000 in the checking account. And now customers come into the bank and want to borrow money. And the bank says, sure. And they just make $9,000 worth of loans. And they write the loan balances in their customers' checking accounts. Then the customers you know, take the uh, uh, balance. And they go out and buy things. Uh, by the way, it's no different if the, if the bank, uh, again, there can be various uh, ways in logistically in which this is done. Banks typically would write a cashier's check, right? So if you go borrow money for a, for a car or whatever, they'll write you a cashier's check. Or sometimes they would write the check directly to the home builder if you're building a house or something like this. It's no different, though, because the merchant's going to get the cashier's check and deposit the funds in his bank. Right? And, and so it's still fiduciary, right? It, it doesn't matter where the funds are and whose checking account they are. What matters is the ratio between the overall checking uh, account balances and the reserve. If that's a fraction, well, then we've got fiduciary issue. Okay, so this is what happens. <clears throat> now, uh, the first thing we want to notice about this, of course, is that this activity cannot be regulated by profit and loss. And this is our first indication that it's not integratable into the market. It would seem that any process whose production cannot be regulated by profit and loss could not be part of the market. <clears throat> the reason for this, again, is that um, the bank earns the full rate of interest, the full retail rate of interest on the loan that they make, and yet they don't pay a rate of interest to anyone to borrow the money. In fact, what they do, instead of contractually paying someone to borrow the money and then intermediating, being a middleman in between the saver and the investor, instead of doing that, they just create the funds out of thin air. Now, again, uh, if, if you don't see right away that this is different, uh, let me just rely upon the analogy of, uh, of our uh, uh, friends at the Federal Reserve who just print money. Isn't it similar, though? Right? They just print money. They don't bear the opportunity cost of production of the money. 
And so when people who get this new money spend it, who does bear the opportunity cost? Who is the loser of command over resources when the new money is being spent? And the answer is, well, it's indiscriminate people who get the new money later in the process, right? It's people who haven't contracted to give up their command over, over resources. They're just victims of this, of how the process plays itself out. So the same thing here. Nobody borrows these. Uh, I mean, the, uh, nobody contractually agrees to reduce their command over resources by lending money to the bank. The bank just creates money, substitutes out of thin air, lends them to people. Those people have more command over resources. Somebody else has to have less. And the people who have less, of course, are people who get the, the newly spent money later in the process. Right? So that sort of a process is, again, not integratable into the market because if the bank took the rule of production, let's issue all the fiduciary media that's profitable for the bank to produce. If, they, if that were their only rule of production, aside from obeying all the general laws of society and so on, they would bankrupt the bank. Right? They would instantly drive the bank into, into non-solvency. They would make loans to any Tom, Dick, or Harry who walks in off the street. Right? They can get maybe one payment out of them, and that's still profitable. So, of course, they, they, they can't proceed this way. They have to have a policy. They have to have an arbitrary policy that says, we'll only lend to credit scores that are this high. We'll only lend to these classes of assets. We'll only make collateral loans, and so on and so forth. They, they, uh, so, so we have something uh, new here, something different <clears throat> from what we had before. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, hopefully, uh, uh, regardless of how you absorb that argument, you can see right away that the bank is, that issues fiduciary media is illiquid. The bank has instantaneous liabilities. Whoever holds the checking account balance can come to the bank uh, on demand and receive the money reserve at par. It's an instantaneous liability. And yet the loans that balance out that liability on the asset side have a time dimension. So now they've leveraged, right? They've created an interest rate differential by leveraging. And, well, okay, that's different. We saw the banks in the, uh, under 100% reserve don't leverage. It, they, they, they're restricted, at least, in their leveraging. <clears throat> okay, so this is a problem. The banks also become insolvent because, as we suggested before, if they're going to increase their supply of credit by 20%, what kind of customers are they going to lend to? They've already lent to their best customers. They're, they're still economizing, right, their supply of credit. So they have to lend to customers that they wouldn't lend to before, less credit-worthy customers. So the whole integrity of their asset uh, side of their balance sheet is put in peril. This process of fiduciary issue then provides the monetary fuel for asset price inflation. So how do we get... Uh, you know, uh, asset bubbles in the economy. Well, we get the, the, the fuel, the cause of it is this uh, continuous increase in, well, in our economy, in both uh, fiat money and in fiduciary issue. Without that, if people wanted to finance their investments in one line of production, they would have to draw them out of another line. And so prices would be moderated in some lines when they increase in others. But with asset price bubbles, that doesn't happen, right? We get something new again that doesn't occur in the market as we've uh, developed it so far. It's also true that this makes the whole banking system unstable. And the reason for this is because as asset prices rise, it affects the balance sheet of all the banks, whether they engage in fiduciary issue or not. As all the housing prices rose in the, in the uh, housing bubble um, in the early 2000s, then all the, all the uh, uh, collateral values of all the banks that were holding loans against these houses improved. And suddenly they had equity in their loan, in their loan uh, in their, on their balance sheet, right? That they could exploit by extending further liabilities, by le leveraging even further. And so on this process goes, again, something that uh, would not uh, happen in the uh, unhampered market economy. So this is, <clears throat> this is how we would uh, diagram monetary inflation. So now we can have a system of monetary inflation where the supply of uh, a fiduciary issue, the money substitutes, can just be increased ad infinitum. There's no restriction of profitability on, on the issue. And so we see this progressive reduction of the purchasing power of money or progressive uh, price inflation in the economy. 
And the same with credit expansion. We get credit uh, a creation or credit expansion. This uh, uh, sort of artificial increase in the supply of credit that isn't driven by a lowering of time preference, but is just uh, additional fiduciary issue comes into existence by additional fiduciary issue uh, over time. Now, as uh, you'll hear in uh, lectures later on, this process of monetary inflation and credit expansion uh, generates the business cycle. So this, this may generate a, a boom-like uh, economic environment, may look great on paper for a while, but it's self-reversing, and, and you'll hear about this later. He, at this point, we just want to establish the, the, uh, the conclusion that uh, if there is fiduciary issue, if there are fractional reserve banks, then they will put in motion monetary inflation and credit expansion, whereas 100% reserve banks and commodity money system will not do this. It's a, a big uh, uh, difference between the two systems. <clears throat> okay, here's another quote, just to again uh, rely upon uh, arguments from authority. Uh, the transformation into fractional reserve banks, holding fractional rather than 100% reserves against deposits, was in fact revolutionary. It led to the leveraged financial institutions that dominate our financial systems today. I can't fool you twice, right? It's Paul Samuelson again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well. But rather remarkable, okay? That's, uh, that's uh, it's just uh, helpful, uh, helpful to be reminded that we're not right-wing nuts, right? We're not like a crazy conspiracy theorist when we come up with this. It's just a, uh, it's a lo logically recognized <laughs> implication of the difference of the systems. Okay, now let's turn to the last uh, issue, this issue of uh, uh, whether or not uh, an argument can be made to uh, justify the inclusion of fractional reserve banking in the market economy. What, what sort of, we've already indicated that this seems, um, uh, it seems like you, you can't do this, right? The microeconomics of it seem like it's a different phenomena, fiduciary uh, issue, from a uh, money certificate issue. We get an entirely different uh, dynamic, entirely different uh, economic uh, macro effects. So, but, but is there a counter argument? Is there some sort of uh, position one could take that um, it makes us think, well, that it, it's still part of a market because it gives us some sort of market result that we can't get with the other system. So, so that, that's the issue now. And so that's what... Um, those in favor of this uh, fractional reserve banking argue. They argue that this fiduciary media issue would um, exactly or roughly uh, offset any increases in money demand that if you didn't have this fiduciary issue would lead to price deflation. And we're going to set aside in this talk, we, we just don't have time to do this. You'll uh, see some of this in other lectures. Uh, but there's a, there's a presumption that price deflation is damaging to the operation of the market economy. There's just, we'll, we'll leave it at that, right? There, this uh, line of argument just assumes that price de deflation that's put in motion by an increase in money demand leads to depressing economic results. So we'll, we'll set that aside. That's a, that's a separate issue. Um, there are many of us on our, our side of this argument who claim that that's not so, but again, we don't have time to run through the arguments at this point. We want to focus on a different question, right? Okay, so this is how the, the argument would run. If uh, money demand goes up, <clears throat> then, uh, then this would uh, signal to the uh, fraction reserve banks that they need to issue more fiduciary media, and they would issue it, and since the money demand has gone up, this, this additional fiduci fiduciary media, the additional checking account balances and so on, would be held by people and not spent because money demand's gone up. That's the assumption, right? And then the purchasing power of money would stay roughly the same. So we can increase the money demand, a, you know, roughly commensurate increase in the total stock of money, and every, everything's wonderful. We get no price deflation. We save the uh, market economy from... Uh, sliding into the, this depths of depression <clears throat> uh, from uh, uh, price deflation. So, so that, that's the basic thrust of the argument. Now, <clears throat> Ludwig von Mises uh, actually dealt with this issue in the Theory of Money and Credit, the book he published in 1912, where he said there's a difference in the operation between what he called a banking system, how banks operate in a system of banking, and what he called independent banks. So, so let's follow out the logic of this. 
Now, we're going to take the independent banks in the second step, but suffice it for the case that I want to make about the banking system itself. If, if we have independent banks, then independent banks cannot, as a group, issue significant amounts of fiduciary media. We'll see why in just a minute, but let's take that as a conclusion that Mises reaches about independent banks. They cannot. So the only way that you can have a banking uh, regime that has fiduciary issue increasing to meet increased money demand is if you have a banking system. It's the only way it can be done. You have to have a banking system. In a banking system, what happens is, in order to uh, absorb the additional fiduciary media, what has to happen is the clientele who are not customers of banks have to be given some kind of a reason to hold the money. Because when the customers of the bank gets the additional fiduciary issue, uh, issue, they'll spend some of it. And well, some of it will go into the hands of clients who just turn it back to the bank, right? They redeem it. And then you wouldn't get this expansion that you need. So, so the argument depends upon some sort of a system of, of banks, agreements among the banks that, uh, the, um, that they will redeem the notes of other banks or something like this so that the whole system can increase in lockstep. But once you take that step, as Mises pointed out, then it, you, uh, the issue of fiduciary media will not be regulated by money demand. And the reason for this is on the chart that we showed before, right? It's always profitable for the banks to issue more fiduciary media. They, get, they earn interest. And if they issue fiduciary media in excess of the increase in money demand, it will simply push the purchasing power of money down so that the quantity demanded of money will rise. And the entire issue of new fiduciary media will be held. And so the system, <laughs> you're you know, caught in this dilemma, right, if you take this line of argument. You have to have a banking system for the argument to work. If you have a banking system, well, the banking system can't, in fact, check the issue of fiduciary media in the way that it's been suggested, or at least it's problematic. <clears throat> uh, now, what about this other claim, though? This all rests upon Mises's argument that independent banks will not issue more uh, uh, significant amounts of fiduciary media. And here, he, uh, the point he makes is, again, a very basic one. If you're in a competitive environment with other banks and they're issuing fiduciary media and you get wind of this, your strategy as a competitor, of course, would be to accumulate some of these notes and then present them to the profligate bank and bankrupt them. So, so there's this competitive pressure among the banks they don't cooperate with each other by redeeming each other's notes or anything of the sort. Quite the contrary. They're, they're, they're cutthroat. They're wildcat bankers who, who are constantly trying to put their competition at a disadvantage, right, by hoarding up their notes and presenting them en masse for redemption. So we get this almost complete restriction of the issue of fiduciary media as long as banks are independent. They operate with their own reserve, <laughs> independent of agreements among themselves to have mutual redemption clauses or, or whatever the, the legal aspects of this might be. <clears throat> now, let me just uh, summarize with, uh, with uh, one, one last comment. Uh, and this has to do with, uh, well, what could, could price deflation be problematic and what would the market, uh, how would the market system react to this if it were? So, so again, we're setting aside the issue of whether or not it is. Let's just assume it is. So let's suppose that we had a commodity like gold produced in a market economy, and uh, it didn't expand enough as money demand went up. The production didn't expand enough to prevent price deflation. And let's say for whatever reason, this created economic problems. Then uh, are we just stuck in this world? Do we now have to go to fractional reserve banking to solve this problem? And uh, no, we don't. Entrepreneur, this is just another uh, opportunity for entrepreneurial innovation to earn profit. The entrepreneurs would just now select, instead of gold, a different commodity that had similar properties that was more readily producible, like silver. And then the production could be more expandable, and the problem of price deflation uh, could be avoided. Uh, so I've run over a little on time. Sorry about that. So we'll quit here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.